best advice I ever got in security. Go. Fight through failure. A success is at the other side. It's time to begin the CISO Series podcast. Welcome to the CISO Series podcast. My name is David Spark. I am the producer of the CISO Series and joining me as my co-host for this very episode, many of you know him. His name is Mike Johnson. Mike, let everybody know you're here. Hi, everyone. I'm here. This is my voice. You've heard it before. You're hearing it again. Yeah, you've heard it before. You're going to hear it a lot more today. A lot more. So if for some reason you don't like it, stop this podcast right now. I mean, why why are you here? Or mute when Mike's speaking. But the question is, you're not going to know when Mike stops speaking. So you you just got to get used to it. You're just going to have to get used to it. Has anyone actually been annoyed with your voice, Mike? Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> like someone would tell you. Could be. I, has anyone ever told you they're annoyed with your voice, David? No, nobody has. Yeah, said so that. I don't think that's a thing that people say. I don't I'm think annoyed by your voice. Is not. No, but it, like there's there's like they're the Fran Drescher voices of the world that those are empirically known to be annoying. But at that point, that's your brand, right? Like you're you're, it is you're you brand. lean into an annoying voice at that point. Well, she she gains success of it. Some people don't gain success from their annoying voice. There, there is that. Right now, everybody's thinking because I'm thinking of somebody that does have an annoying voice does does not garner success from it <laughs> at all. It's just unfortunately what know. they were born with. Yes. <laughs> We're available at CISOseries.com, where you can hear all the most melodic voices you ever will want to hear, (laughs) including Mike and my own. Our sponsor for today's episode, a phenomenal sponsor of the CISO series. They keep coming back year after year, and we love having them, and that is Veronis. Thank you, Veronis, for sponsoring. More about Veronis, I'll be talking about later in the show. But first, Mike, I have said this before. I've got a very high tolerance for compliments, but here is the new kind of compliment that I like hearing. And I'm interested to know what, if you've heard something similar, is that, well, it's not new. I've heard this for a long time, but the impact this show is making on people's careers. Like, I learned so much, I'm able to do my job better, or people got hired connecting to guests on this show. Have you heard something similar? I've certainly heard... And I've heard from po- folks who've appreciated the podcast saying, hey, this has helped me. I've learned some things. I love the podcast. But beyond that, of that thing that you said, I really, that really helped me. Or that discussion that well, you What had. is, I want to know one thing that oh, you said that I helped can't, anyone. I can't come up with that <laughs> off the top of my head. That's not even fair, David. I know. <laughs> but generally, for sure, what people are saying is, I really like what your guests are saying. I get that a lot. Yes. And and the other thing that we say, the variation is CISOs who are kind of in their own little bubble in their sort of world like to hear what other CISOs are saying. And I'm assuming you like that just from all the guests we have on this show. I've said time and time again, one of the personal enrichments that I get is meeting CISOs from all walks of life, folks who I would probably not talk to on a regular basis. Well, here's a perfect example. We have a CISO who leads a military organization, and we have not had that before on this very show, and thrilled to have him on. It is a CISO for the Air Force JADC2 R&D Center, Terrence Cooley. Terrence, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thank you guys for having me today. Should you hire this person? Are you applying a talent to value recruiting technique to reduce corporate risk. In a McKinsey and Company article, they suggested mapping how staff can reduce risk and utilize all your resources to hire the high priority role so as to reduce risk the quickest. So this sounds really logical, but I'm really interested to know, does anyone actually do this? So they recommended actually mapping out the talents and skills needed to reduce specific risk. Mike, have you ever actually done this in hiring? And how manageable is this technique? Makes sense, but really, can you pull this off? So I had to laugh a little bit reading it of who has 150 hires in cyber right now to like do it once. Like it was just McKinsey lives in a different world uh, than most of us. 
Yeah, yes. They kind of assume, oh, if you've got a team of 150 security people, you've got them all one day. Right, right. <laughs> Just showed up with one day we had none, the next day we had I'll 150. You, I worked for this television network, Tech TV, and they did need to hire like 90 people within six weeks. It was bizarre. It was the most, it was the strangest thing I ever saw. I think really the gem in this, and I think the thing that people can take away, I agree what they've described as logical. What they're really saying is, Figure out what it is that you need your ICs to do first. Start there. Rather than trying to build a leadership team, which I guess is a way that some people operate, I've always looked at what does my team need to do? What do we need to be working on? What are our skills gaps? And start there. You're then hiring the people to do the work. And then you're on top of that hiring a management team to support those folks to help them to provide them the structure and the guidance on actually delivering. The concept makes a whole lot of sense to me to the point where I can't imagine doing it any other way. All right. We're gung ho on the concept. We're trying to see how we could actually apply it. Terrence, you live in a world of risk. There's nothing more than what you do is risk. And I'm assuming personnel in general are applied to deal with risk all the time, manage it. Has this been done in the cybersecurity field? And can it actually be applied similarly? It can, though I think it does make a few assumptions that don't fully apply to us. Uh, writ large, every single member of our organization or the Air Force, big picture, has a specialty. That specialty has defined characteristics, and we can apply those characteristics to say, I need this to support this risk. If I have a deficit in IT, I'm going to go through my Rolodex of IT professionals, and I'm going to hire against that space to solve that risk. And then I can be more specific and targeted mindsets. Do I have people who are, have leadership potential who can stand up and lead the teams around them in a technical capacity? Do I have people who are manager or people people that can oversee technical operations and really tailor down the risks from a layered process? But we get people in onesies and twosies. So I have to look at every risk that I have, map the specialties that I want to that, and either hope I get it or be able to reach out and direct hire against that, but never in mass. So I'm getting the sense this McKinsey model very much applies to what you're doing, yes? Yeah, in the sense that because of we have a, a, a stronger definition of the risks in our environment by nature, a lot of the things we do are steady state, and they all lead to one unfortunate but uh, realistic outcome. If I have a risk in my network, it directly ties into an operational risk tying into crisis operations, helicopters, planes, people putting their lives on the line. I can directly map every specialty I need to how can this skill support this thing that prevents lives from being lost. That's really interesting, and I got to assume. I mean, you hire, but then you, I would assume, build your training programs against that as well. Yes? Yes. And it also depends a lot on the, the organizations you've been part of. I've been part of an organization that had a robust training pipeline that we were still building from the inside, but we had the personnel to do it. My current organization, we are the training pipeline. I have. Oh, I would assume, yeah, the, 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 the people who are working it. So I got to assume that a percentage of everybody's work is dedicated to training others as well, yes? If not training others, then building the processes that they'll use regularly so that when someone comes in to replace them, they can just hand that over cleanly. But we don't have, uh, in my current work, we don't have the expectation that 100 people are going to stand up, at least not yet. That's coming, and we are working towards that training pipeline. Here's some surprising research. What are your predictions for the evolution of cyber threats? Now, a cyber threat report from Deep Instinct highlights three trends. First, malicious actors looking for or paying for the weakest link to provide access. And as they say, and what appears to me, it is far easier and a cost-efficient method to just pretty much find that weak link or pay to get that weak link. Protestware, uh, that's the self-sabotage to one software or weaponizing it to cause harm to its end users. And then end of year attacks, and I would ask the two of you, and I'll start with you, Terrence, is there some sort of special advantage to attackers to attack at the end of the year, or is it more of a situation that everyone is winding down, maybe their guard is down, but not the attacker? So what do you think? Let's start with that last one. What do you think of that last one and the others? And do you sort of see some other sort of trends 
for the new year. Yeah, so end of year tax is a persistent thing across the Department of Defense Enterprise as, as a whole. There's always an expectation there's going to be some employee fatigue or your defenders are kind of putting themselves more in the holiday space. They want to relax a little bit. So what we do is we have a lot of rotations in our organization across the whole outer shell to make sure that people are staying fresh. So more specifically more in December? Yeah, because we know that the attacker knows that there's an expectation. So we know that they know that, and they should know that we know. And it's a really little <laughs> fun cat and mouse game. All right. So that is something that you acknowledge and believe is okay. Now, what about the other two examples here? The, you know, just paying somebody off or protest wear here. I can see a case for paying someone off, but you're not going to see that a lot in the government space. There's a lot of high profile cases where that has happened. I'm not discounting it, but I mean, there's double agents. There's double agents, the but it's it's high profile for a reason because we're able to find it out. And through our robust security applications in terms of criminal justice teams that actually research and look for people being bribed and things like that, it's very easy for us to eventually. So there are other them. departments that deal with that that are watching that kind of thing. Absolutely. And then when you talk about just looking for self-sabotaging or trying to weaponize, it's, I don't know if that helps. That's really a, a Department of Defense issue. So I, I don't have a lot to say on that one. All right. So I'm going to throw it to you, Mike. At your company, do you have the looking for bribes department? One of the things to really think about on that line in the report is it wasn't so much paying off people for their passwords. It's really talking about this concept of an initial access broker marketplace. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the the yes. idea that... That's what I was referring to. Essentially, get, getting some type of access. Well, but that somehow some group of actors has gained access to a set of environments. They don't, they don't want to do anything with it. They're not going to monetize that, but they can monetize it by selling it. And we have seen those attacks. Those have been... That was famously one of the methods that the lapsus groups used earlier in this year. And what I think is interesting about that world is you used to have the attackers like kind of being uh, fully vertically integrated. Like they would have to figure out how to break into an environment. They would then have to figure out how to use that access to then monetize it further. What we're seeing is now some deregulation, I don't know how you want to call it, but they're breaking up into specializations, teams of attackers that are going to figure out how to get access into environments, usually malware that they're spreading or they're somehow tricking folks. And then they're selling that. And that's how they're monetizing it. So that's absolutely a thing. I expect to see more of that. And I expect to see, especially as people figure out how to deal with multi-factor authentication and leverage, almost leverage multi-factor authentication to take advantage of those initial username and password thefts. And, and we've definitely seen examples of that. So let me throw just out to both of you, adding to this list, what would you add to the list in terms of sort of trending of attack behavior that you're seeing right now? Terrence? I definitely have an opinion on this. I think the number one successful technique that I've seen in my environment is phishing. And they're becoming way, way, way more sophisticated. But what I'm actually expecting to see more of a trend of is when you talk about vendors, they have a kind of standard process that they use for when they're sending things out. I expect to see more phishing attempts look like vendors, but actually start to be more targeted in, hey, I know you have this kind of a problem. We have a tool that can you can support it. If someone comes to me and can solve one of my problems, I am going to be more interested in that conversation. I'm proud to say it, right? So if you have, if you can find a problem that I want solved, you have my interest. And if you can leverage that, social engineer your way through, I can expect to see some people make their way through the cracks here and there. Good point. That's a great example, by the way. And by the way, we hear that all the time. All CISOs are like, yes, if you don't have a problem, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen if you've got a solution for it. Mike, what trend are you seeing? Well, first of all, I want to react to what Terrence said, which is, David, we have to be careful. We're educating the attackers. Like we're, we're, we're providing them the roadmap on, on how to get into these inboxes. I think the, the thing that I'm expecting to see more of is uh, API attacks. Oh, yes. And we just did a re recent show on this stuff. 
I'll just throw it from what I've seen in my own education on API security is how unbelievably complicated this issue is. Yes. And that's why I think you'll see more of it. First of all, you haven't seen as much of it because it's kind of hard to abuse. It takes a lot more effort on the part of attackers, but it's given, it's risen to a point where it's worth it for them to figure out. And then the complexity to actually secure them is going to give the attackers some runway, at least through the next year. Before I go on any further, I want to mention our sponsor, Veronis. We greatly appreciate Veronis supporting this episode of the CISO series. So many security incidents, as you know, are caused by attackers finding and exploiting excessive permissions. All it takes is one exposed folder, bucket, or API to cause a data breach crisis. So the average organization has tens of millions of unique permissions and sharing links. Even if you could visualize your cloud data exposure, it would take an army of admins years to right-size all these privileges. With how quickly data is created and shared, it's like completely painting the Golden Gate Bridge, which someone does, and it takes forever. Not one person, but many people. So if Veronis reduces data exposure while you sleep with the industry's first fully autonomous data remediation. Veronis continually and intelligently removes unnecessary permissions, sharing links, and fixes misconfigurations without any human intervention. Because Veronis monitors who uses data, their free incident response team will watch for alerts and call you if they see abnormal behavior like insider threats or compromised service accounts. To see how Veronis can reduce risk while removing work from your plate, head on over to veronis.com slash CISO series. You can remember that, veronis.com slash CISO series and start your free trial today. It's time to play What's Worse. All right, we are here for What's Worse. Terrence, you know how this game is played. I do make Mike answer first, <laughs> and I love it when our guests disagree with Mike. Mike, here is the scenario. And um, by the way, this has come from Dustin Sachs of World Fuel Services. He's given us lots of great scenarios. In fact, he's one of the people who, who loves what the CISO series has done for his career. So we greatly appreciate and we appreciate that we are helping him out. This is a what's worse scenario that I'm surprised took this long to come up because it seems <laughs> like this is an obvious one. Here we go. What's worse? 100 small security incidents spread out across the entire week, all manageable, but 100 of them, or one massive incident at 5 p.m. on Friday. Oh, interesting, Dustin. So I... So it's death of a pay, uh, of a thousand paper cuts or not. Yeah. <laughs> well, but the, the thing is, I feel like I live the other one all the time. That's exactly what I said to Dustin when he goes, he's going to say that is my normal week. Yep. Like, <laughs> everything is going fine. Friday at 5 p.m. rolls around. I get a little Slack message that says, hi, Mike. And I just put my head in my, in my hands because I know where that's going. In your career, how many weekends do you think you've got had ruined? Honestly, not not as many as folks might think, but more than one. I've certainly uh, had to leave a voicemail with my wife on more than one occasion <laughs> with some bad news like that. But I think for these two, I would much rather deal with the one incident. It sucks. Both of these are terrible. But at least the team will rally around that and have a feeling of like, this is something that we can get our hands around rather than, oh my God, another one, another one, another one, another one. It just feels like it's never going to end. So while both of these suck, just that constant, constant drip. The constant beating of the drum. Will drive people nuts. All right, Terrence, I throw this to you. 100 very manageable security incidents through the week or one nasty one at 5 p.m. on Friday. I was so ready to be a dissenter. I was so ready. <laughs> but having lived through large breaches, large-scale individual breaches, and dealing with that, that is something that is just more comfortable to work through. 
a hundred breaches. Now I'm like, how do I keep my team? It's from not a hundred breaches. It's a hundred incidents. It's a me... hundred incidences that are again. I just want to stress manageable. Manageable, but I now have a hundred different chains of custody, a hundred different things that I've got to update all my stakeholders on. I've got a hundred different meetings that I'm now keeping track of. <laughs> That's just the place to juggle. If my team doesn't go insane, I sure will. All right. So you pretty much are the same response as Mike is that it'll just drive you crazy. Yeah, it's the the grind that just wears you down. And you add the fact that it's it's the domino effect of each one will just be overwhelming. Yeah, that you just lose so much in an action economy. Yeah, I, I think something else that I'd like to just highlight that, that Terrence said that I think folks don't really recognize is there's the incident itself and then everything that goes on around that. And you don't really realize how much goes into the follow-ups, the communications, all of the work that goes on outside of dealing with the thing that really adds up. So I didn't realize, I thought there was, and, and you tell me, what percentage of incidents can you sort of shut down and not make anybody else's issue? I wouldn't say there's a hard percentage. I would say a lot of it depends on the scope because first you have to get a sense of how bad is the incident, which means you're building a rapport, you're doing assessments on it, you're getting a a sense and wrapping around, okay, is this something that's beneath our threshold? And you have to do that every single time. Yeah, okay. So the answer is there are no small incidents. No. (laughs) Um, maybe you shouldn't have done that. So on the heels of our what's worse segment, I'm going to ask this question. And I'll start with you, Mike. What is the worst security behavior you've seen from an IT vendor? So the reason I'm asking this question is it came up in a conversation I overheard of a few CISOs discussing. And I'll give you the two examples that I overheard. One was a vendor's tool had a problem with the company's long passwords. So they lowered (laughs) the password requirements so they could work with the tool. That seems bizarre. And then another vendor just had issues with the VM, so they lifted all the security requirements to get access to the VM. What's the worst you've seen? So my favorite is where you have these phishing test platforms, and the people use them to fish their own employees. And the first step is you have to go in and whitelist, allow list them in your own mail program to allow them through because their fishes get caught in your own automated testing. And so so just this idea that you're testing the awareness of your employees by lowering your own defenses <laughs> drives me nuts. So that that's that's my favorite example. The fishing so the answer is the fishing company should be able to break through your defenses. And why is that a good test of employees? Like, what? Why? 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 Well, no, is, no, no. But I mean, they sh- their product should be good enough to be able to break through your defense. And if they're unable to do that, then maybe their fishes aren't all that great. Yeah, that's lower it so our service will actually work. <laughs> all right, Terrence, what's the worst behavior you've seen? It's not directly IT vendor, but I think it's close enough that there's a, that you can take something from this. We had. Back when I was doing my program management under IT security days, we had a vendor who was responsible for shipping out some of our equipment, high power amplifiers from one place to the other. They didn't have a good change management processes. So there's a code we use in order to track all of our shipments. In the middle of doing a shipment, they changed the code itself so that it used a different format. So the object went from, instead of going to Africa, it went to New Jersey, and they couldn't <laughs> find it for a month. <laughs> Needless to say, we don't work with that vendor anymore. Have you hold on, have either of you had a situation where a vendor? Because this, by the way, this just becomes a general third party vendor situation where the vendor, I guess, was going to do their security at a certain level or couldn't achieve a certain level, and you just said, "Guys, we love you, but it's just you know this ain't going to work out." because you're not reaching our minimum requirements? Well, usually that's as part of the the TPRM, right? So, right, yes. it's a part of the early process, but security defenses do sort of fall. Do they ever fall or no? They do, and one of the dirty little secrets of third-party risk management is people quite often just do it once and don't come back and check again. And when that comes around for, I didn't realize how bad your security is, is when there's an incident. And you get this vendor notification of, 
a really bad breach that should have been avoidable. And that's when you have those conversations about, it's not us, it's you, we're going to go find somebody else. You probably don't have this issue so much in the military, Terrence, because you're constantly checking. We're constantly checking, and I can hold my entire force accountable, and I can hold my partnerships accountable. Here's the answer. We just simply have to have a, a security program up to snuff like the Air Force. Right, Mike? I think there's positives and negatives to that, I David. agree with that <laughs> statement, and we'll leave it at that. <laughs> They're young, eager, and want in on cybersecurity. A security analyst who has been at the job for a year feels overwhelmed. The Redditor posted on the cybersecurity subreddit that they're on a team of five analysts with over 10,000 employees. The analyst has the following responsibilities. They monitor two SIMs, mostly do incident response themselves, the, those five analysts. They investigate DLP alerts. They have uh, HR and legal investigations. They run phishing campaigns. And they also have to do their own training as well. So some people responded, you know, you're getting burnt out. You need help. But the most popular response was from a person who had a very similar experience as the Redditor. And it lasted for them for four years. In, in the case of the Redditor, it's just been one year. And what kept them there was a fantastic culture and great support. And the company did end up hiring more people, and it really launched this person's security career. So I, I really want to double down on this response of the combination of it's really tough, but fantastic culture. I'll start with you, Terrence, because I got to think that's, that is the job of the military. How do you create a fantastic culture in a really difficult environment? And what are the elements to keep people staying in what seems like an impossible job? But like, essentially, your opening tip to this very show. Ah, yes, yeah, absolutely. So you have to fight through failure, right? I am dual-hatted as the chief people officer, so I have also that perspective from the HR lens. And one of the things we did was first we assessed what is it that our employees are looking for? What is it they came here for? And pretty much the number one thing, I think you're going to see this across any high performer, is they came and they work here for a sense of purpose. They want to know that the things that they are doing has value, that they are trusted, that they are a subject matter expert and will be treated accordingly. So we create the environment that we cut a lot of the bureaucracy within the organization to whatever I can control. Get rid of the admin. You need to go to someone. You need to go straight to the CEO. You don't need to go through me. You don't need to go through four levels of administrating to get there. You go and make sure your product is good. I trust you, and we will give you feedback if we need a few more tweaks, but I trust your knowledge. I hired you because you have the expertise. And then if I have people who need certain accommodations like remote work, or they really need to focus on work-life balance, but they can work from their home and be just as productive, and they have that proven record, I can cut them out so that they can actually remote work from home and figure that out. And then as long as I call and you're there when I need you, I can make that work. I like that. Mike, how do you, how do, you do the combination of, yeah, it's really, really tough, but we're going to make it because you're going to want to keep doing this really tough job. I don't think the it's really, really tough has any factor here. I mean, it, it's a job at the end of the day. And you're needing to create an environment that people are going to want to be a part of. Well, well, I'm just going back to this Redditor's comment of like, I just feel, you know, this person has, you know, imposter syndrome. They feel overwhelmed. It just seems like too many tasks. I'm like, I'm drained by the end of the day. Like not everybody feels that at their job. It, you know, you say it's job. I mean, that's an overwhelming feeling, but a lot of people have that and still love their job. I think if you ask most anyone in cybersecurity, do you go home tired every day? They're going to say yes. That is the reality of our profession. And as Terrence was mentioning, give people that sense of purpose, that sense of mission. And that's really what compels people into our industry to come and do that every day is that sense of mission. So give them that opportunity in their career to live that, to trust them. I'm over here cheering as, as Terrence is, is walking through how he handles it because it's absolutely right create the environment where you're trusting people, you're giving them that sense of purpose, and they're going to want to work there and they're going to want to stay. So from your world of the military, Terrence, what would you advice would you give to the private sector people to sort of apply this, you know, culture under sort of very difficult circumstances? 
first off, make sure if you say you have an open door policy, actually have an open door policy. People can come to me from across the organization, whether I'm the direct report or otherwise, they can come straight to me and I can have, we have a closed door conversation and you can just get your grievances out. Sometimes people just need to be listened to. If they have grievances, they're looking for solutions. Make sure you're identifying if there's solutions that I can fix at my level or if I need to uptail, let me know what that is, or what those are so that I can actually solve them. I have to know what's, what's eating your lunch so that I can actually give you support. And making sure that you have that trust relationship that, hey, you tell me what you need, I go get it for you, boom. And then what can I take off your plate? What I do? There's a lot of things I have to do, but there's time that I do have dead space where if you're struggling with this thing, maybe you just need someone to sit over your shoulder and help you through a task. Maybe you need someone to teach you a specific capability or a specific tactic. Maybe you just need someone to take a thing off your plate that's really a heavy lift for you. Let me know what those are. Excellent point there, Terrence. And that brings us to the very end of this show. Terrence, you just slammed the knowledge here on this episode. So thank you so, so much. We've had guests on before who have military experience, but nobody who's currently working, I don't think, I don't think I've had anybody who's currently working for a military organization on our show. We've had government officials, but not military, I don't believe. I'll have to check our past guest list. So brought us a phenomenal insight on this list. So I am going to ask you if you're hiring, whether civilian or not, uh, if that's a possibility. I do want to thank our sponsor for today's episode, Veronis. Uh, Veronis, thank you so much for supporting the CISO series. We greatly appreciate your continued support of this these shows. Uh, Mike, any last thoughts from you? Terrence, thank you so much for joining us. I I really appreciated how you talked about people a lot. And one of the things I didn't know- in Part of his title. Exactly. Like the, the I, I think you might be the first CISO I've met who's also a chief people officer. And I, I think that's a very interesting combination and probably puts you in a interesting side of conversations uh, as a result, but it gives you a perspective that I think a lot of CISOs don't have. And so thank you for sharing that people first mentality. I really liked your, your point about if you say you have an open door policy, actually have an open door policy. And the fact that a lot of people, they just want to be listened to and they want to know that they can go and have a conversation with someone, especially someone who can actually help them out. So I, I, you know, thank you for that tip exactly of have an open door policy and actually live it. But thank you in general for bringing all of your insights, not only from your your security perspective, but also your people perspective. Thank you. Excellent. All right, Terrence, any last thoughts, any recruiting requests you may have or hiring as well? The floor is yours. All right. Thank you for all that. I was glad to be on the show. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. I am generally very responsive to connection requests. If you're a vendor, please make sure that you're asking me for a problem set first. Don't just give me a sales pitch. And for hiring, I am hiring. If you're military, I have a few special positions. If you're civilian, there's a slightly higher bar, but we can have a conversation and I can vector you the right way. And there are clearance requirements, I would assume. There are clearance requirements. That's a conversation we can have. But if you've already been cleared before, it is likely you will be cleared again. All right. We did not have a clearance requirement to have you on the show. <laughs> That's the, we have uh, little to none in that. Experience. However, our audience, we're going to we're going to have to have a conversation. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, we will have to have a conversation with the audience. Excellent point, Mike. Uh, thank you so much, Terrence. That was excellent. I greatly appreciate that. Thank you, Mike, as well. And thank you, as always. We greatly appreciate your contributions and listening to the CISO series podcast. That wraps up another episode. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do. We have lots more shows on our website, CISOseries.com. Please join us on Fridays for our live shows, Super Cyber Friday, our virtual meetup, and Cybersecurity Headlines Week in Review. This show thrives on your input. Go to the Participate menu on our site for plenty of ways to get involved, including recording a question or a comment for the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at david at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to the CISO Series Podcast.